Okay, good morning. I hope um, everyone can hear me. Um, I am Soledad Cortina, and I'm going to talk to you today uh, specifically about the Boston Taiwan keratoprosthesis and um, how we can select patients and manage them focusing on the international patient. So if you have any questions, we're gonna have some questions and answers at the end, and feel free to just um, send us those questions along. I have no financial interest in this topic today. So um, why do we need an artificial cornea? What is the problem? So we know that worldwide, there's an estimate of almost 5 million people that are bilaterally blind. That means that they have worse than 2400 vision in their very best eye. This unfortunately includes 1.5 million children. And the truth is that traditional keratoplasty has only a modest impact in corneal blindness. If you think about the numbers, there's only 180,000 transplants performed worldwide that would have little impact in this 5 million uh, people. And about half of those transplants are performed in the United States. So there's a shortage of donor corneas, be it for cultural reasons, administrative reasons, financial reasons. We are estimating that there's uh, close to 13 million people awaiting a corneal transplant in one eye. And only 240,000 corneas are recovered. And over half of those recoveries are performed in the United States and India combined. So the truth is that 53% of the world's population has no access to corneal transplantation. And even when they do have access, there's a high failure rate of keratoplasty uh, for high risk indications. So in the majority of uh, blind people from corneal disease, penetrating keratoplasty is not even tried. So these Statistics that are a little bit old from 2008, but I think it highlights how there are um, many countries like uh, China, for example, in which the, um, uh, the wait list for a corneal transplant is really, really large. The, uh, why do we need to do corneal transplantation? Well, um, these are the indications uh, according to countries, and we see that um, in the majority of the developed world, uh, as uh, Fuchs dystrophy followed by keratoconus, and then infectious keratitis in the more tropical climates and underdeveloped countries. And uh, this is from um, a, a global survey performed by uh, Sight Life in 2016. It was published in JAMA of Ophthalmology. And it shows uh, the different countries, the size of the country means um, the, uh, the, the, the prevalence of corneal blindness and then the colors uh, they're color coded as to how ready these uh, uh, these countries are uh, for uh, corneal transplantation programs, and we can see that uh, the largest country uh, with corneal blindness, but is the most ready, uh, would be India. And then from this same paper, uh, this global sur uh, survey, uh, this one shows uh, where the corneas are coming from and, and, and which countries are actually being able to procure corneas. And we see that um, there's only uh, the United States, <coughs> maybe Italy, that, uh, that are exporters, so they, they, ship country, they ship corneas across uh, the world. There are some countries that are self-sufficient or almost self-sufficient. And then there's a large number of countries that are not sufficient uh, or, or really that there's no corneas recovery, like many countries in Africa, for example. But say that we do have corneas. We know that corneal transplantation is the most successful solid organ donor transplant in the, in the human body. So we have 80% survival rate of five years uh, in low risk grafts. But if we look at high risk grafts, those patients with autoimmune diseases, chemical burns, um, with significant corneal neovascularization, limbal stem cell deficiency, even glaucoma, the survival rate is between 25% and zero at five years. So it really, really, uh, the success rate goes down. So um, these are the three most commonly used keratoprosthesis in the world. And there are two broad categories. We call them type 1K pros and type 2K pros. On the type 1K pros, which is used for a wet ocular surface, that means an eye that uh, is able to blink, that has tear production, uh, the, the, 
the, the most commonly used is the Boston Type 1 K-Pro, and there are some, um, you know, iterations of this device, like the uh, Lucia K-Pro and the Auro K-Pro that is uh, uh, manufactured in India, but they're all, you know, uh, derived from this uh, device, from the design of this device. And then for those patients with very dry ocular surface, cut, uh, surface keratinization, um, like patients with uh, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid or, Steven, or severe Steven Johnson, severe chemical burns, we use the uh, osteodontoceratoprosthesis, which is the one that you see on your lower right-hand side of the screen uh, right here, and or the Boston type 2 keratoprosthesis, which is <clears throat> similar to the type one, but has a longer stem and goes through the eyelid. So today on this webinar, we're gonna focus on the type one. So we're gonna focus on those eyes that uh, have you know, the ability to blink and have a relatively moist surface. So this is our first question here. Um, uh, and it's which of, the, uh, which of these patients is the best candidate for a type one keratoprosthesis? And uh, you have four photographs here and uh, we're gonna give you some time to answer. All right, very good. So it looks like the majority picked B, and uh, that is correct. So uh, for a type one keratoprosthesis, you know, the first one is a completely ankylo blepharon. This patient uh, is not a candidate for a type one, the way the eye is looking right now. Um, uh, C, you know, it could be a candidate, but it has some significance in blepharon, some ocular surface inflammation, and the same with D, you know, so these patients may need further work before we can even think about implanting a type 1. However, B is a failed graft with vascularization. This would be a perfect candidate for a type 1 keratoprosthesis. Um, so uh, the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis was designed by Clay uh, Dolman, um, and it was approved here in the United States in, 19, in 1992, and it's indicated for those patients that have a poor prognosis uh, for penetrating keratoplasty. What is the device like? Well, it's a color button design. The optic is made of PMMA. The backplate locks into place with a ring or uh, just with a titanium backplate with a C-shape, and I'll show you another photograph of that. So less than uh, over 10 years ago, the, the use of keratoprosthesis was really limited. The complications were very high, uh, high infection rate, high incidence of extrusion. But this, the past decade or so, maybe 15 years ago, uh, it has shown improved in the device design, improved in post-operative management of these patients, reduction of complications, and really uh, it's a lot more accepted by corneal surgeons wor worldwide. To the point that now it is really considered the preferred option for those patients that have a poor prognosis for keratoplasty. And over 12,000 keratoprosthesis have been uh, implanted worthwhile. And we're talking again about the type one. <clears throat> why, why did we see these improved outcomes? Well, the design changed. Uh, uh, the uh, holes were introduced in the back plate that decreased the rate of melting of the carrier tissue. Um, then we identify prognostic categories, helped us select patients better that, for which we were implanting these devices. We started using prophylactic antibiotics to decrease the rate of endophthalmitis and introduced the bandage contact lens used to improve the hydration of the tissue, uh, protection of the ocular surface and decrease the rate of melting. So the early K-Pro design that you can see here had a 51% rate of melt uh, because it had a solid back plate and we thought that not enough nutrients were reaching the uh, um, carrier uh, transplant uh, from the uh, aqueous humor. So now eight back plate holes are, um, were introduced as you can see in this picture right here, uh, the difference and, and the rate of melt decreased to about 10%. So the new design introduced a um, uh, titanium backplate with a C, uh, uh, C locking design. So this doesn't use a ring anymore. And this is the old model that is still available where you can lock it with a titanium ring. The advantages of the titanium, um, sorry, the advantage of the titanium backplate is that it, it has a thinner profile. So the anterior chamber is less crowded. <clears throat> So uh, something important that we found is that uh, really the use of, of the Boston keratoprosthesis uh, has a significant 
impact in the vision-related quality of life. So we did a survey and we asked these patients before and after implantation and the uh, vision-related quality, uh, quality of life by the survey, the survey improved significantly. So who is really a candidate for keratoprosthesis? This is what we want to discuss today. Well, as with any other surgery that you do, of course, indication is one of the most important uh, aspects of, this, of, of the success of your surgery. So selecting the right patient for the right procedure. So this is our question number two, and it's which indication is considered to have the worst prognosis in keratoprosthesis, and this is in general. And yeah, so, um, I think the, the, the very best prognosis are those patients just with, you know, non-inflammatory conditions like multiple failed grafts. I think aniridia, you know, has a, a, a guarded prognosis in general because of the syndrome and the fibrosis and glaucoma and everything else. But in general, it's a good indication for keratoprosthesis. Chemical burn, you know, there, 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 there can be quite severe and depends on the degree of chemical burn. But I think by far, Stephen Johnson syndrome with the autoimmune um, etiology has the worst prognosis. Um, so indications for Boston type 1 K-Pro, uh, repeat corneal graft failure, any, any, um, any etiology for limbo stem cell deficiency, burns, SJS, and iridia, any vascularized cornea with poor prognosis, even neurotrophic keratopathy that would have a um, guarded prognosis for penetrating keratoplasty can be good candidates for uh, Boston type 1 K-PRO. And here in this um, table, you can see how we group the prognostic categories. So our, our good prognosis, anything that is non-inflammatory. Intermediate prognosis is some, you know, there's some inflammation, history of infection, chemical burns, <clears throat> herpetic keratitis or neurotrophic keratitis. And aniridia, it plays aniridia here because um, I do think that there are uh, they're a little bit more complicated than just your regular repeat corneal graft failure for a keratoconus, say, uh, let's say. And then the worst prognosis, all your autoimmune diseases like uh, Steven Johnson syndrome and ocular cicatricial pemphigoid. So which of the following is a contraindication for keratoprosthesis implantation? And this is our third question. I'll give you some time to answer. Good. So yes, I think uncontrolled inflammation is a, is a contraindication for keratoprosthesis implantation. Uh, you should not implant them when there's active inflammation because your results are going to be bad. Patients, the, the tissue is going to melt. They're going to uh, have um, many complications. So do everything that you can to control the inflammation before if it's, you know, topical medications, systemic immunosuppression, whatever you need, but the inflammation needs to be controlled before you implant. A fakia actually, <clears throat> it is not, and I prefer to implant the keratoprosthesis when the patient is a fake um, because I think there's less crowding in the anterior chamber. I think, um, you know, we do need some tear production. Uh, so Shermer's test, you know, uh, a good Shermer's test is a, is a good indication. And neovascularization, that's actually one of the indications. That's why we do it. We know that uh, PKP will have a uh, high rejection rate, and that's why we do the keratoprosthesis. So there's three key features that I, I want you to think about when you're examining a patient and thinking about a K-Pro. Number one is a moist ocular surface. So it doesn't have to be a Shermer's of 10 at you know, 10 minutes or whatnot, but, but there has to be some tear production. If there's keratinization, it's, it's, if it's a bone dry surface, uh, the type one is gonna do very poorly. Uh, furnaces that can accommodate a contact lens. So if there's significant symblepharin in the side and they cannot have a contact lens, then the tissue may desiccate. So you may want to think about reconstructing these patients first before you venture into the uh, keratoprosthesis. So significant symblepharin is something that you want to stay away from. And then you want to have, again, controlled ocular surface inflammation. So think, think that not the worst case in your practice uh, is the best candidate for a keratoprosthesis. Because when we think about this procedure and we think about artificial cornea, our instinct is, okay, you know, the very worst a patient that you have, this is the patient that I'm going to implant a capro on. But if you look here, for example, this patient with Steven Johnson syndrome, completely keratinized in, um, in ankyloblepharin, this is not a candidate for a type 1. This needs a osteodontal keratoprosthesis for a type 2. 
This patient right here is a very severe chemical burn, but it seems like after reconstruction is doing okay. You know, the fornices are okay. You can see there's some tear lakes, some tear production. So this patient would be okay for a type one. Same thing with this patient that has aniridia. So this is also uh, uh, a good patient for a type one. This patient right here, you know, very poor eyelids. There's ocular surface inflammation. This would be a more guarded, and I, I would definitely not do your first capro in a patient like that. And of course, the multiple failed grafts, multi history of multiple rejections is kind of the best candidate to start yeah, implanting capro. So uh, we use it for repeat corneal graft failure. It's an accept, uh, acceptable alternative. The visual rehabilitation is faster. We don't depend on immunosuppression therapy. Um, so this is a good indication. For, con uh, for corneal dystrophies, that are highly recurrent. For example, this patient that had gelatinous uh, drop-like corneal dystrophy, so an amyloid dystrophy, she had had 17 lamellar keratoplasties before we did a capro, and it kept recurring and recurring and recurring, and you can see the degree of vascularization that a penetrating keratoplasty would never work in her. For, so these sort of patients are good candidates for a type 1. Remember that not all of your autoimmune patients are a candidate for a type one. So again, there's, with every disease, there's a spectrum. So those patients with Steven Johnson syndrome, for example, that have a wet ocular surface, that have very controlled inflammation, that there is no active disease, those patients are a candidate for Capro. Never, never, never on the active disease state. Um, for limbal stem cell deficiency, including aniridia, I think this is a very good indication. Um, don't forget, though, that your uh, persistent epithelial defects and corneal melts may have higher incidence in these patients, and aniridics tend to have more, uh, a higher incidence of retroprosthetic membranes, maybe because of their tendency to fibrosis. In severe ocular trauma, in particular, uh, ocular burns, uh, I think it's a good indication but please don't forget about glaucoma. This is a huge issue in patients with chemical burns with or without keratoprosthesis and can significantly worsen after keratoprosthesis implantation. So always think about how you're gonna manage glaucoma in this patient. But think that stabilization of the ocular surface first is always necessary. So don't rush into the capro. Sometimes we're in a rush to rehabilitate these patients visually, especially when their injuries are bilateral but to have a stable ocular surface is key before we move into keratoprosthesis surgery. Uh, like we talked before, for a carpetic or neurotrophic disease, it's, it is not a contraindication like some other versions of other types of keratoprosthesis were, like the alpha core. So this is actually a good indication. But the prognosis for those patients with HSV keratitis, for example, or carpetic keratitis, is not as good. So we, we, we have them on our intermediate prognostic category. In pediatric corneal disease, this is a group that we would love to have a keratoprosthesis that works because, you know, when we do transplants in, in, in babies or, or in very young patients with congenital anomalies, the transplants don't do well and, um, and the risk of amblyopia, even with a clear transplant, is significant. But the truth is that keratoprosthesis are very high risk in this group of patients and there is more evidence to suggest that the outcomes are poor. So I would say stay away in very young patients and perhaps in my own experience, patients that you, know, that you can reach them with a corneal transplant, develop their vision and maybe you know, after the uh, age of 10 or so, you know, they respond much more differently to the keratoprosthesis and they can have a much better outcome. It can be as a primary penetrating procedure. So you don't need to have patients that have had, you don't need a, 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 a failure trans, uh, a failed transplant to put a keratoprosthesis if you already think that this patient has a poor prognosis for PK. For example, the cornea is completely vascularized or, or they have limbal stem cell deficiency. You know that uh, a penetrating keratoplasty alone without a limbal stem cell transplant, for example, will not work. So these patients can have a primary keratoprosthesis. And then another good indication is those patients that have uh, hypotony or, or retinal disease with silicone in the eye, and they have recurrent keratopathy from the silicone oil or corneal decompensation, they can have a, a relatively good, um, good outcome with a keratoprosthesis. 
So how are we going to evaluate these patients? How are we going to plan surgery? So of course, like you do for any other surgery, a thorough history, you want to estimate the visual potential because most of the times you cannot see in the back of the eye. You don't know the retina status except for your ultrasound to make sure it's anatomically in place, but we don't, you don't, we don't know functionally. Same thing, we don't know the status of the, of the optic nerve. So trying to get an idea of what the vision was like after their last transplant, you know, the history of glaucoma before, to, to, to make sure that if we do a keratal prosthesis, we're going to get some improvement and we, we're not going to implant a device, you know, with no improvement in vision for these patients. Think uh, that maybe a decent candidate can be a better one. So this patient, for example, with a chemical burn, significance in blepharon looks at, like it's inflamed. We're going to decide, well, let's reconstruct this in blepharon, do a bacomycosal graft in the eyelid, you know, prepare the surface better before we implant the keratal procedure. So assess that. You can reconstruct with amniotic membrane or a, a mucous membrane graft. Consider the need for immunosuppression. Look at the eyelids. It's important that we address eyelid abnormalities, if not before the surgery, immediately afterwards. So if there is significantly exposure, you know, tarsorophies are your friends. So if you want to do a permanent lateral tarsorophy, maybe, you know, a third of the way, that gives a lot of protection for the ocular surface and, and can improve the outcome of your keratal prosthesis for, for some patients. So always look at the eyelids and make sure that, that they're, not, uh, they're not significant abnormalities that need to be addressed. Uh, you're going to do, before the surgery, think about imaging these patients. You can do an ultra ultrasound UVM. You can do anterior segment OCT to get an idea of what to expect inside the anterior chamber. Do I have an ACIOL? Do I have a PCIOL? Do, you have a, do, do I have a crystalline lens? And what am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to do cataract surgery. But if the patient is phacic, if they're pseudophagic, I'm going to keep the, the uh, intraocular lens and I'm going to remove it. All anterior chamber lenses need to go. Uh, posterior chamber lenses that are in, in the bag and stable, you may decide to leave in place. And that's why you have two models of the type 1 keratal prosthesis, one for aphakic patients and one for pseudophakic patients. And then also, yeah, anterior segment imaging can give you an idea what's going on with the iris. You know, do I have a normal iris? Do I have synechiae? And what to expect when you open these eyes? And these are just some examples of, you know, iris adhesions, uh, prefrontal synechiae. And in, the, uh, in this one here, you can see how the IOL looks nice and stable in the back. So you can look if these patients have had glaucoma, where is this shunt <clears throat> located? Do I, am I going to need to reposition it because it's going to interfere with my keratoprosthesis or not? Also, you're going to do an, um, an A scan. Uh, or uh, an axial length measurement, because if you're going to go with the uh, aphakic model, you're going to need to uh, you, you're going to need to provide um, the uh, axial length to be able to order these keratal prosthesis, or at least have an idea. Now, some of the lower cost keratal prosthesis that are the same model as the Boston Type One, they come only for one axial length, and then the residual refractive error you would um, you would correct with the bandage contact lens. You always want to have a posterior ultrasound just to make sure that there's no gross uh, posterior segment pathology that you need to know about. <clears throat> Surgical planning also needs to include glaucoma. So, because this is really the main cause of permanent vision loss after we implant a capro. So everybody that has pre-existing glaucoma and is on medications will get a shunt in my book. Everybody will get a shunt at the time of capro. If somebody doesn't have glaucoma, that's still controversial. And you may decide to still put a shunt, depending on what the pressure is. And I, uh, I'm leaning towards this option in many of my patients. And then think about the role of diode. If the patient has had many shunts before, or there's no room for a shunt, there's no good conjunctiva for a shunt, uh, diode can be useful <clears throat> sometimes. What are the considerations about glaucoma implants? Things that we have to think about. Well, there's going to be a crowded anterior chamber because we're going to have the back plate inside, inside the anterior chamber, uh, the iris. Um, many of these patients with severe ocular surface disease have conjunctival scarring, so the risk of shunt exposure can be greater. Um, and then you have to think that you're going to have to fit them with a contact lens, and you don't want a bulky plate 
rubbing against the contact lens causing conjunctival erosion or exposure. And these, in these photographs, you can see some of the complications, like a poor contact lens fitting because of the shunt, the exposure of, of a parts planar clip, and here the exposure of the shunt. So <clears throat> what do we do? We have developed this technique where we place the shunt in the parts planar. So it asks for more surgery because now we need to do a parts planar vitrectomy on those patients that have not been previously vitrectomized to be able to put the, the shunt in the parts planar. But you can see how nicely you can fit a large contour lens uh, with a very nice and flat profile. Uh, the shunt has much less risk of exposure. And here is an anterior segment OCT showing the entrance of the shunt. It's about four millimeters posterior to the limbus. So <clears throat> this is the keratoprosthesis. This is how we construct it uh, for surgery. Uh, there's a, a small adhesive that you can place the front plate on, or you can just use a little bit of this elastic to kind of give it some hold. You're gonna pre-trefine the graft. Um, I usually use 8.5 millimeters for the graft. You can use nine just to be bigger than the, than the uh, back plate. And then uh, there's a derm punch that comes with a kit. We're going to refine the center of the graft. Um, it is three millimeters. Then you thread that through the optic. And then you're going to put the back plate. Um, you can push the back, back plate with this hollow white pin. It also comes with a kit. And then you're going to place the titanium locking ring over, um, over the stem. I usually just at this point push with my index finger to try to uh, have it in place. And then with the hollow pin, um, you finish pushing it in and you want to hear this <clears throat> snap that it, it, it goes into the groove. And then you want to inspect your keratoprothesis 360 degrees and make sure that uh, the titanium locking ring doesn't have the arms one higher than the other, that everything is in the groove and that the stem is protruding the same amount 360 degrees around. If you're using the model with a titanium backplate that has a C-shaped titanium backplate, the same thing, um, you, you wanna inspect it all around, make sure that the backplate is leveled and not one arm of the backplate is higher than the other. Um, okay. So this is our technique uh, and I'm gonna run you this, this we call it the, the triple K pro procedure because we're gonna do first the shunt uh, you can use an AMED or you can use a bare belt. With the bare belt, you have the hypertensive, you know, phase initially. So you, you, a lot of these patients are on oral uh, diamox or acetazolamide uh, for the initial six weeks. And then if you do a, a, an AMED, then you, you don't have a problem with this. Um, so we usually just uh, put the plate before we open the eye and then we're going to tuck the shunt in. Now we're going to uh, tree fine uh, and open the cornea. And my retina specialist likes to do the vitrectomy through a temporary keratoprosthesis, so we suture this now. Uh, now, the, the vitrectomy can be performed uh, through the permanent keratoprosthesis. It's just it's difficult to get that far out because the opening is less. Uh, of course, with a temporary keratoprosthesis, we, it's very easy to <clears throat> clean the vitreous in the periphery um, and make sure that where the shunt goes in, uh, there won't be any vitreous uh, clogging the shunt in the future. So like I said, it's about four millimeters posterior to the limbus. We enter and we're gonna um, make sure that the entry point is where we wanted it, that we're not going through retina, that it's in the pars plana. And then we're gonna insert, uh, insert the shunt in this area. And um, after this, uh, we will close over the, over the shunt <clears throat> We will close over the shunt and put the, um, the, the permanent keratoprosthesis. You can see here that I'm using a back plate that is smaller. You have two options for back plates. It's an 8.5 millimeter and a seven millimeter back plate. So here I'm using a PMMA seven millimeter back plate. Is the, it's considered the pediatric back plate, but I really like it because it's easier to suture and, um, and, the and, and it's less crowded inside the anterior chamber. We use the patient's own cornea to cover the to cover the shunt in this case. You can use cryopreserved corneal tissue as well. 
Uh, but you know, it, it, it saves some resources and you can use just uh, the own, own patient's corner that works pretty well too. And this allows to see the shunt under, under, the, yeah, under, the, um, under the tissue. So now we're closed and uh, this is the end of the surgery. We're gonna place the contour lens. Uh, this also comes with a kit with a keratoprosthesis and the standard lens that we use is that <clears throat> uh, 8.9, 9.816 millimeter, uh, at least for uh, the starting point. So how do we care postoperatively for these patients? Mm -hmm. So it is labor intensive. The type one patients are those patients that are gonna need frequent follow-up. Uh, patient education is key, and an interdis interdisciplinary approach is also very important because these patients will have a complication at some point, and to be able to have in your team, if you're a cornea specialist, to have um, a glaucoma specialist that can help you, uh, somebody to fix the eyelids from ocular plastics if you don't do that, um, contact lenses and retina is very important. So our question number four, um, give you some time to answer is, how often should I examine my K-Pro patients? All right, every three months, fantastic. Yes, that is the correct answer because there are many complications that can happen that are asymptomatic. So when the patients are doing great, totally stable, they see you every three months. If they have a problem, of course, you may to see them sooner, depending on what that is. But at least every three months for those stable patients, because corneal melts, for example, can develop asymptomatically and you might be able to catch them. They can have infiltrates around the, the stem without any symptoms, you know, fungal colonization. So every three months is the right answer. <clears throat> So uh, what do we do for follow-up care? <clears throat> we see them every three months after the initial post-op period, of course. Tell them to avoid eye rubbing. Uh, you're gonna encourage compliance with the treatment specifically with antibiotic prophylaxis because they stop the antibiotic prophylaxis and they come back with an infection you know, more often than not. Um, inflammation control. Initially, we use prednisolone acetate 1% four to six times a day and then we taper it and then you leave it as needed. You know, some patients just need one drop a day, you know, for as long as they have the caper on to just keep that surface inflammation under control. We use a bandage contact lens. The initial lens that we place is a contour 9.816, and then we modify as needed. Some patients may have a different curvature and you need to go bigger, smaller, flatter, steeper, um, so you can play with the lens. Some patients can just use a... a um, a regular contact lens that is not a contour, like a night and day, for example, contact lens, and those are okay. Mm -hmm. um, you're gonna disinfect it every, vi at every visit, and most patients do not handle the lens. So when they come to see you, you remove the lens, you disinfect it, or you give them a new one, depending on how long they've been wearing that lens. <clears throat> contact lens can have some complications, for example, like deposits in this case right here. If they have a lot of deposits that are very frequent, you may want to move to a hybrid lens, which are those lenses that have a central rigid uh, aspect and then a soft skirt. So the deposits can, you know, localize in the skirt, but at least the central portion remains clear. And then uh, for those patients that can have significant glare with the Capro or for a cosmetical, cosmetic purposes, you can use tinted contact lenses uh, that look very good as well and can match the other eye. So uh, infection prophylaxis is, is very important. You're gonna adjust the, the prophylaxis depending on what the prevalence of infection is in your area. Uh, so what we use here in the United States might be different from what you know, uh, people use in India or, or in China or in Europe. So it all depends on what the prevalence of infection in your area is. But you know, <clears throat> vancomycin 15 milligrams per cc for high risk patients was what's, what's recommended, plus minus a fluoroquinolone. Polytrim, which is a combination, um, uh, can also help, uh, can also be a good idea for low risk patients. If you uh, don't have good access uh, to antibiotics or um, you have high resistance rate, rates in your area, perhaps betadine 1% can be tolerated, not by every patient, but by some patients. And this is uh, the recommendations by Mass Ioneer for the Boston type 1 K-Pro, for the non-autoimmune patients, and for the uh, autoimmune patients. Um, 
fungal prophylaxis. So, you know, you have a patient with poor ocular surface that can be on chronic steroids and chronic antibiotic prophylaxis and wear a contact lens. It's like the perfect setup for a fungal infection, right? So you want to be very vigilant of this. If there's high fungal uh, infections rate in your area, you may consider uh, fungus prophylaxis maybe once a month or every three months. And you can use amphotericin B or you can use natamycin. Uh, and then just watch for colonization of uh, fungal colonizations on the contact lens that might look like this. Uh, monitoring for glaucoma. So the intraocular pressure will be difficult to assess. So you can have to use palpation. Sometimes pneumotonometry over the sclera can give you an idea. That's why imaging and visual fields are very important. And you can do normal visual fields in these patients. You can do a Humphrey uh, 24-2. Uh, but I find that Goldman visual field fields, especially for those patients that have lower vision, uh, are very helpful as well. And then imaging the optic nerves uh, is important. And all of these, all of these uh, the visual fields and this imaging is from a <clears throat> paper patient of mine. So you can get excellent imaging uh, on these patients. So question number five, what is the most common cause of permanent vision loss after KPRO? I think we went over this a little bit, uh, just testing, if you're paying attention. Exactly. So glaucoma, this is the most common cause of vision loss in general. Now, endophthalmitis is an important cause, and it looks like the audience did recognize that because of the severity of the fulminant <clears throat> uh, cords that can have. Uh, but it, on patients that are compliant with their prophylaxis, <coughs> excuse me, thankfully, you know, the rate of endophthalmitis is much lower. Post-operative complications. So we can have infectious endophthalmitis in a rate of 2.5 to 5%. Glaucoma, new onset or progression of pre-existing disease. Remember that the vast majority of these patients are going to have glaucoma from before. So it's not all the caper causing the glaucoma, but it's, but, but it's really the main cause of vision loss that we see overall. Serocaratolysis, anywhere between 10 and 17%. Infectious keratitis and retroprosthetic membranes, which is you know, probably the most common complication. So which are the most common organisms causing endophthalmitis in Capro? This is question number six. Gram positives, that, that is the correct answer. Now, um, acanthamoeba is rarely recognized in Capro. I mean, I know that these patients do wear a contact lens and it can happen. Um, uh, fungal is a, is, is a significant organism in gram negatives as well, particularly because of the use of prophylaxis for gram positives, because really most of the infections come from the ocular flora of this patient and are gram positive. So, you know, now that we're giving vancomycin prophylaxis to, to cover gram positives, then gram negatives and fungal infections can rise, but still uh, by large gram positives are the most common um, organisms. Uh, so uh, risk factors, you know, the, the CAPRO can provide a potential path for bacteria into the eye because this is particularly a keratoprosthesis. You know, all prosthetic devices in the body are at risk of infection, but this prosthetic device has contact, simultaneous contact with the outside world and the inside of the body. So that is why the risk is so high. Um, you know, a compromised ocular surface, local immunosuppression, the bandage contact lens, etc. But with the use of prophylaxis, the, the incidence of endophthalmitis decreased significantly. So that's why we always have to encourage the use of prophylaxis in these patients. Infectious keratitis can be anywhere from three to 16% may precede endophthalmitis. And we see that there's almost like a 50-50 incidence for infectious keratitis between bacterial and fungal. So in the absence of um, a causative agent, uh, negative cultures, or on initial empir empirical treatment, you might consider treating for both, depending on how it's looking. Glaucoma development of or progression, like we talked, leading cause of permanent vision loss. The mechanism is likely multifactorial, and we have difficulty assessing the IOP. So sometimes we may think patient is doing fine, but really glaucoma is progressing. So that's why we really need to be aggressive. And we have shown that shunts actually help reduce the risk of developing glaucoma or the, the risk of progression of glaucoma in KPRO patients. 
We see how the angle closes over time, which is one of the factors why glaucoma develops or progresses after Capro. This is a patient and you can follow from before the keratoprosthesis, you know, two, one month, three months, six months, how the angle kind of zippered and, and went into angle closure. So ideally, you want to team up with a glaucoma specialist. You want to um, treat IOP elevation at your lowest suspicion. You want to fo follow the angle with imaging if you can, because that can give you a clue as to what's happening in the anterior chamber. Um, you, you need to have a very low threshold for a, a shunt placement in these patients. Um, and I think that sometimes uh, IOP lowering drops can have a reduced effect because of the decreased surface contact with the artificial cornea. And oral, of course, uh, carbonic uh, anhydrase inhibitors can have a, a role here as well. Retroprosthetic membranes is the most common complication. They can be significant because they obscure the visual axis, but also because they can increase the risk of sterile corneal melt. Uh, and this is what we've shown how uh, retroprosthetic membranes can increase uh, the risk of melt. We, we saw in patients that had the thicker membranes had the higher risk of, of melting. Um, Risk factors for uh, RPM are infectious keratitis and aniridia. This group of patients tend to have more RPM than other patients. Uh, steroids can help. So, you know, per preoperatively and, and, and then topical steroids can help decrease, you know, the severity or any sort of immunosuppression for that matter. So you can use anterior segment OCT to measure these membranes. And here you can see an anterior segment OCT on somebody without a membrane, a very little membrane that's kind of growing, and then a thick membrane right here. So the treatment will be with laser, uh, and it's pretty easy to do. Um, if it's very thick, you may need to do part spina vitrectomy or a K-Pro exchange. Thinning, melting, and extrusion. Uh, it did decrease with the uh, with the impl implementation of the back plate holes and the contact lens, and the retention today for the uh, type one K-Pro is very high from 80 to 95%. But a very thick RPM is a risk factor. Surface inflammation and epithelial defects are risk factors. Contact lens loss is another risk factor. And of course, eyelid abnormalities that cause exposure are also risk factors. So here you can see an expanded keratoprosthesis and we're peeling the uh, retroprosthetic membrane from the back. You can see how thick that membrane is, so almost like another cornea. You can see the area here of the melt the absence tissue coming up to the, uh, the cylinder of the uh, keratoprosthesis. So you're gonna replace it, the capro as soon as possible. Sometimes you can try to patch it uh, with different tissues. It could be with cornea, it could be with sclera. Uh, sometimes some uh, people in Spain use dura to, uh, to cover the area of the melt, but what works the best is obviously replace it if you can. You can use glue if the melt is small, uh, cyanoacrylate glue. And you always want to address the risk factor so that it doesn't recur. But uh, luckily, if, if you treat it well, patients go back to their baseline vision, and this is a, actually a complication that we can successfully treat. So uh, finishing up here, key things. You want to watch these patients closely. You want to uh, remember that glaucoma can progress very rapidly if the IOP is not controlled. These are not patients that progress the, like the primary open angle glaucoma patient, these patients progress fast. So if the IOP feels high to you, it is probably high, so do something. Make sure the patient understands that the risk of infection and knows to walk in the door with minor symptoms. So access of the patients to you or to a, a, a care center that, that can care for these complications is very important. If you implant a capro and the patient go, goes to leave seven hours away and can never come to see you, that's probably not a good idea. Some complications may be asymptomatic, like steroid melts. So that's why routine, frequent office visits have a big role. So in summary, key factors to improve success of your K-Pro surgery are a careful patient selection. Prepare your patient for K-Pro implantation. Don't rush into it. Think about things that you can do to make the environment for the K-Pro um, better. Uh, have a solid surgical plan. Don't forget about glaucoma follow your patients closely and diagnose and treat complications early. So thank you very much. And uh, I think now uh, we have some time for questions. Yes, thank you, Dr. Cortina. So we have one question so far, if you wanna stop sharing your screen. Okay, stop share. Yes. 
So um, the question is, when do you replace bandaged lenses? Um, so uh, the, le the lenses can stay in place for a long time, especially the contour lenses. So you can keep them in place for about, I usually keep them in place for about six months and then I disinfect every time they come. Uh, for the other lenses, like the night and day lenses that are meant for one month, uh, I usually replace them every time they come, which is every three months. Um, but I always disinfect every visit. And, and, and something that I've been doing now also is when I'm disinfecting the lens, I may put a drop of 5% uh, uh, betadine on the surface of the eye and then wash it and, and put the lens back. Great, thank you. Um, that looked like the only question. So I'm just gonna share my screen quick. We had some questions asked at the time of registration. Okay. If, since we have some time, if you wanna yeah. go through these. Um, have you any experience in using KPRO in CVS? I'm not sure what CVS is. Um, let me move this away, hold on. Uh, so please let us know your best contact lens parameters for KPRO patients, how much that costs for a patient, and is it compulsory to use contact lenses? Okay. So usually the contour is what, what is considered the, the best, and we start with the uh, parameters that are 9.8 um, base curve with 16 diameter lens, and then we adjust as needed. I would say that, you know, probably about 70% of patients will be just fine with this lens and you're not going to have to change it. And then other patients that may have a very flat surface or a very irregular surface may need some adjustments. Um, is it compulsory, the use of contact lenses? Uh, one way you can get away from not w using a contact lens if the patient has good conjunctiva, um, yeah, just don't spoil it for the shunt, but you could do a, um, a, a, a Gunderson flap over to protect the cornea, especially in those patients that you know, lose the contact lens off, uh, often because there are patients that no matter <clears throat> how many adjustments you make, they keep losing the contact lens very often. Uh, and then, um, uh, some patients might be okay without a lens. Uh, these are the minority, but uh, one of the things that I look at to decide whether I can keep them without the lens is sometimes you can see a corneal epithelium growing over the, um, over the capro, and that kind of seals the, the area, the junction between the graft and the, and the artificial cornea. And so um, then you can, uh, you can leave them without the lens pretty successfully, but I would follow them closely initially when you're leaving them without the lens. Um, with KPRO2, what is your opinion regarding type one? So yeah, I think they have different indications. The type two is for very dry eyes uh, and keratinized eyes or, or ankyloblepharon. And then, uh, and then they have to be bilaterally blind. And then the type one uh, <clears throat> is for the wet ocular surface. So uh, they're asking me if I have um, any experience with computer vision syndrome in KPRO. And the answer is no. I, I've never implanted for these indication. Uh, has, what, is, what is the age limit? So I think keratoprosthesis works very well for the old, for example, because then they can, you can rehabilitate them very quickly. Um, so I think for uh, older people is great. Uh, like I discussed in my presentation, um, pediatric cases are very, very tough. And I think that, that the outcomes on very young kids are not good with this KPRO. So I would stay away from it until at least they are, and this is my own experience, until at least they are around 10 years old. what would be the best vision that we can expect from a KPRO patient? So uh, it all depends on what their potential is. So uh, I have many patients that are 20-20 uh, with an artificial cornea, if they have a normal retina and a normal optic nerve. So uh, that is the nice thing about the KPRO. You don't have to worry about post-operative astigmatism. Um, now, the, the, is the quality of the vision as good as normal vision? Probably not, because they're looking through the cylinder there are some videos <clears throat> that I can share with you some other time where you, we can estimate about, you know, what the vision is like. They do have some disability glare. And for this, 
a tinted contact lens can be helpful. Uh, but I think in, in terms of, you know, your Snell on visual acuity, if they have the potential, they can see 2020. Uh, if a patient has good vision in one eye, would you consider doing a K-Pro in the other eye? Um, I, I do, yes, but it all depends on what the reason for the, um, uh, for the disability in this eye is. I think that in general, you know, keratoprosthesis is better thought of when, when patients are bilaterally visually impaired. Uh, but uh, if the patient is motivated, if, if they will have good access, they have one normal eye and the other eye, um, you know, has a problem and it's not a candidate for a regular transplant, then yes, my answer is that I will implant the type one K-Pro, but I would never implant a type two. So the type two, the, those that go through the eyelids or the osteodontokeratoprosthesis, that is strictly for bilaterally blind patients. How much will the cost be in general? So I think that all depends on uh, where you're from and where you live in the um, like I said, for example, in India, they have a, um, they, they are uh, manufacturing uh, uh, something that is basically identical to the Boston keratoprosthesis, and it's a, a much lower price, and they can use that. The only difference is that it doesn't have all the axial lengths, and you have to correct the refractive error with a contact lens. Uh, I know that the uh, Boston um, uh, Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary, the, for those, uh, when they ship internationally for those countries that, um, you know, are in more need, they, they significantly discount the cost of the keratoprosthesis. And they're also, um, you know, trying these other keratoprosthesis called the Lucia keratoprosthesis, which again is very similar to the type one, um, which is some small device modifications and it's a much lower price as well. The idea is, you know, they understand that we need a cheap keratoprosthesis that can reach everybody in the world. But um, so the, the cost of the device will be one thing. And then uh, one has to factor in the cost of the anti antibiotic prophylaxis that will be for life as long as the patient has the K-Pro in place. And also, you know, the office, all the visits with you, uh, the transportation that, that all of that requires has to be factored in. Um, and then the potential for more surgery if complications arise or further treatment. All right, Dr. Cortina, that looks like the final question. Maybe we'll wait a couple more seconds to see if okay. any last questions come in. If you implant a K-Pro in a patient, with a normal other eye, do they have any saconia? Um, they, my patients that I have are unilaterally implanted with a, a good vision in the other eye have never complained of that. No, have never complained of any saconia. They, they may say that the quality of the vision is different between the eyes, but they have not complained of that. Can we do laser peripheral idotomy after K-Pro? I think it is difficult, it is difficult. So I would recommend that you do a peripheral idotomy at the time of K-Pro. I think that's the better way to do it, just prophylactically. Um, then if the angle starts closing, there's not much you can do after that. Um, and then you may have to think about putting a shunt if you didn't put a shunt at the time of K-Pro.